so for folks who don't know, um, this is Jason Headley, author and content creator, Easy Cat. You might find him on Twitch, you might find him here, you might find him on Instagram, you might find him on YouTube. He's all the places that you want to be, uh, except for Facebook. No, I'm on Facebook. I just don't advertise that I'm on Facebook. Oh, but good. Yes, well, then we, no, not ta- we won't talk about it. You're on Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, try to do all these things. My, I have a public page on Facebook, like people can watch my reels and stuff there. But I, everything that's there goes from Instagram, so I don't personally like do anything nice. regarding Facebook. Yeah, no, it's just a bigger. T- t- I understand that need sometimes for things. Yeah. Okay, so I have this idea of this journey that we're going to go on today, Jason. Are you okay. are you on board with this? I'm, uh, I'm one foot on board. <laughs> The other foot is on dry land. <laughs> Do you want me to curb my enthusiasm just a little bit? <laughs> All right. Just a little bit. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to calm down my excitement. We go, okay. So, <laughs> since we're talking about being gamers, um, a person is just a pop out a gamer. Uh, they have an inclination. Uh, they start themselves on, uh, on the road. Let's start with your first hardcore nerd moment. Like... Like, what is the th- the the fandom, the game, the instance, like, the class? Like, what would you say is your formative nerd moment? Well, I'll give you, I mean, I'll mention sort of what got me into being a nerd, I think. And then probably I'll also mention what got me into board games. So um, I would say probably my, like, formative nerd moment is when I was really young, like, my family did not have very much money at all. I grew up, like basically in poverty and um one year my uncles and my grandma and my mom all banded together to buy me nintendo 64 uh for my birthday and that was like it was like a big deal that was like the beginning of me being like a gamer and uh board game wise um i was living in new york um and we had some friends that we'd made through some other friends and they invited us to a board game night and they had been trying to get us to a board game night for like months and i had no interest i'm like i don't want to go play board games like that does not sound interesting to me at all really and so finally they convinced us to go and the game was lords of Waterdeep, and oh. um sat down played it Somebody at the table almost flipped the table at one point because they were not really happy whenever whenever something bad happened that so, like, you know, some games have like little things that you can kind of like do things to get in the way of other people doing things. And at mm-hmm. one point that happened. And I, I swear I was like, this guy's either going to flip the table or cry. Um, and <laughs> but I loved it. So from there, I ended up getting the game. We got the game on mobile first and we were like, we're going to play it on our phones. Yeah. And then I ended up buying the game. And we started collecting from there. And that was I want to say maybe like eight or nine years ago at this point. So it's been a that's while. really recent. Yeah, okay. yeah, I didn't that's really recent. I was a full, a full on adult by the time I got into board games. That's okay. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to jump back a little bit earlier. Okay, what year did you write Mythos? Mythos came out in two thousand. Um, I want to say two thousand eighteen. 2018 okay yeah, I think so. so this is after the board game crisis yeah 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 okay um uh i know you like jurassic park like where did jurassic park fit in the nintendo oh, 64 yeah. um, my mom when i was little you know how like parents like read to their kids before bed the what my mom read to me before bed was jurassic park she would read like a chapter a night i didn't know most of what was going on um she took me to see that movie when i was like seven like i mean <laughs> I was very young, but I loved dinosaurs. So she read me Jurassic Park, and she would, like, read it to me every night. And that was, like, the beginning of that. So Jurassic Park has been, like, a big part of my life for a really long time. So Danny Standring has that exact same early experience with it, but it terrified her to the core. And she cannot oh, even it. look at, like, anything dinosaur sends her running. No, I was, like, a, I was a dinosaur kid. Like, I loved dinosaurs. And I was, like, I mean, we went and saw... I think my mom told me to see that in, like, the dollar theater, like, seven or eight times, like, because it was just such a cheap way to entertain me for a couple hours, and I was like, woo, I loved it. (laughs) So that might be your first, like, like, being a gamer is not only about gaming, but it is about the fandoms that we participated in. My first, like, fandom, yeah. You say, we say, all right, so, Nintendo 64, what was your go-to game? 
Um, I re well, the first game they, that I got was Mario, but I really was into a lot of like platformers. So um, I remember probably the game I remember playing the most on it was Banjo Kazooie. Um, I played those games like a lot. Like I really loved those games. Um, I actually didn't get into like those because I really love Zelda now and I talk about Zelda a lot, but I didn't really get into that craze until much later on. Um, and at the time, like the way that I operated with with my Nintendo 64 is I would get like one game a year for Christmas. And so I would just play the junk out of that game. Like that game was like begging for like, please stop playing this game so much. Um, and and so every year I get like one game. So like one year I got Banjo-Kazooie, one year I got Banjo-Tooie, like, you know, Mario. So I had a very small selection of Nintendo 64 games. But I loved so every single one of them. So you were training those gamer muscles, those streamer muscles early. Like, I'm yes. going to sit down. Yeah, I was a video gamer long, really long before I was ever, I mean, way long before I was a board gamer, way long before I even would say that I was, like, a huge reader. Um, like, video gaming was, like, my original, my original fandom. Um, that I don't talk about video games a lot online because the video game, the video game world online is like one of the most toxic places you can find yourself. So I yeah, let's this, this that hits the nail on the head, right? Like, um, uh, Jared recently wanted to live stream with me and to talk about how insulated I am that I feel like games and gamers are filled with go with good people. He's like, no, oh. gaming is highly toxic you have somehow managed to create uh, an island around you of people that uh and i'm like that's not no that's i i brought people together of like love so that we can create a, an island together <laughs> i think i think board gaming in my experience is less toxic obviously there is there is toxicity in the board gaming world um right uh, right but i think the fact that board gaming is so in person, um, a lot of what makes video gaming toxic is that a lot of games are online and there's a lot of power behind anonymity, right? Like if you're anonymous, you're willing to say everything and all the, all the awful comes out, right? I mean, that's essentially what Twitter is, is a bunch of anonymous people being absolutely awful to each other all day long. Um, but hey, gaming, we're Twitter friends. I'm nice. <laughs> wait, sure. But like every time I open my Twitter, I've gotten now to a point where I can't open Twitter before bed because it's so upsetting. I'm like, oh. and then I have a hard time sleeping. So no Twitter before bed. Um, but I Good. think, you know, I think with board gaming, because you're sort of forced to sit around people and actually like engage with other humans, I think it does lend itself to less toxicity than video gaming. Um, like, for example, we go to Dice Tower Con every year, which is a big, it's like a five day long, just play yeah. board games for 24 hours a day, all day for five days. And the community of that convention is so lovely. And like, yeah, you'll get a couple bad eggs. And yeah, I've had some weird experiences with like strangers that are gamers, like not bad, but just like weird experiences. But like, in general, like everybody wants to come and teach you a game. Everybody wants to invite you to sit down to play a game. That is not the case in the video game world. <laughs> no, much. no, no. Um, yeah, there's people working through issues in computer games. I know I worked through my set of issues like while playing computer games. Uh, and sometimes that boils out externally in things that aren't kind to other people or like for me um the toxicity of anonymity in uh online computing uh started day one when i was there at the birth of the internet with al gore uh and somebody used like derogatory terms as soon as like you know i was on the internet yeah. um but that was also not uncommon just walking around on the street right you know, I'm of that age, right? And I'm like, oh, this is just the thing that people used to say all the time when I was in high school. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, like, Izzy from Dice Dragon Guild really talked about it. Like, sometimes it's hard to be the only person like you in a space. But if you uh, stay there long enough and have enough fun, you don't realize behind you are a lot of people lining up to have fun with you. Yeah, who are sure. more like you, right? And that's yeah. um, sort of what I've had to do a little bit for the, like last forever's. Uh, but um, 
things are things are uh, things are better, but it's uh it's really a statement about who you are as a person, the adversity that you had to overcome that you then express in the communities you participate in and the art that you create. So to that end, talk to me about the journey that started you to write Mythos. Um, well, at the time, I had already written uh, Mythos was my fourth book, I think. Um, and... I really wanted to write something. Um, well, so I wrote Mythos as part of NaNoWriMo. So NaNoWriMo is National Novel Writing Month. It's November. You're basically tasked with writing 50,000 words of a novel in 30 days. And a friend of mine was going to do it. Um, and so I was like, well, we'll do it together. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll egg each other on. And um, I wanted to write something new. I wanted to write something that was just really easy and fun. Um, and I'd been working on an idea about a theme park that basically like goes awry for a while. Um, and I kept running into problems because I, at the time, the story was much more of a sci-fi story. Um, mm -hmm. and I kept running into issues where I don't know a lot about the science. So <laughs> I would get into these hiccups where I was like, I don't know enough about that to make that make sense. Um, so at a certain point when I decided to rewrite it for NaNoWriMo, I decided to make it a fantasy story. And that's when like the fantastical creatures and things like that came into existence. Um, and... I wrote it in those 30 days, uh, and then we went through an editing process, and I, I mean, we released the book, I want to say, like, six months after that. Like, it was a pretty fast turnaround. The only thing that was hard was, in general, I'm very much a plotter, so I really like to um, write out the entire plot, bullet point everything, really get, like, a roadmap before I start so that I don't run into Stop flirting with me. I love that <laughs> so much, Jason. I can't take, like... In my heart of hearts, that's what I like to do. My, I'm like, ah, oh, I love that so much. Stop it. And Stop it. <laughs> Mythos was the first time where I basically just started writing and hoped for the best and didn't really know what I was doing with the story at first. I mean, I knew kind of the concept of what I wanted to do, and I knew sort of the characters, and I knew the direction I was going, but I kind of like, I sat down without a plan. And for the most part, it was really fun. But then, By design or by, like, unfortunate necessity? Uh, kind of just by design because I didn't want to think about it. I just want, I was having, um, I, I just wanted to, to write for the sake of writing and not really worry about all the, the bells and whistles or the planning or any of that. And um, for the most part, it worked really well until I tried to add in, I had a twist at the end and um, going back to try and make everything make sense so that the twist made sense was a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. So, because if you don't plan a twist from the beginning, you then have to go back and make the twist make sense. Uh, which was a little bit intense. Uh, but other than that, it was a really quick process, a really quick turnaround, and then we w released the book, uh, I think, in, like, March or April. You say we. Year. Who's we? So uh, Carl worked with, works with me a lot when I work when I write books because he helps with, like, editing. He helps with, like, <gasps> publishing. He, like, helps with all of that, yeah. Oh, that's amazing couple yeah. work. I love that so much. All right, mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about your th first three books. Now, is you, you've you done at least one book since I've been following you on TikTok that you published, like, you know. Yeah, that, that I published as, like, an online web series, like a web series. Right. Novel. Is that your, then is that, that your sixth, fifth, sixth? And then yeah. so what's the one in between Mythos and that one? So I wrote, I have two series. One is called A Love Story for Witches. It was supposed to be a trilogy. For right now, I'm considering it a standalone. Um, it, I did write a sequel, um, but it's not currently available anywhere. It's And I published it, but it's not currently available anywhere. So it's just A Love Story for Witches was my first book, which I published in 2014. And then I wrote the first two books of what I will eventually write more of, uh, which is supposed to be a series called Long Tales, which is very, like, Redwall-esque. Yeah. It's about mouse characters, but it takes place in a post-apocalyptic future where humans have died off and now animals kind of run the world. So it's got fantasy elements, but it also takes place in a, in a future. So there's a lot of, like, tech and machinery and things like that as well. Um, so what I published after Mythos was the second book in that series, and then I did my web novel uh, series. And now I'm working on two things, one of which I will be working on for... Um, in July, there's like kind of a mini NaNoWriMo. So me and a couple of friends are going to do like a short story thing where we're going to each write a short story. And I'm working on something else that I may end up writing for NaNoWriMo in November. So yeah. Wow. That's yeah. crazy. I don't know if I'll ever show anybody any of those things, but I am working on them. 
<laughs> you exhaust me even just like 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 trying to wrap my uh, mind around just how much stuff that you create on a day-to-day basis plus these other like monumentous things like a book holy god it's just that's just I think crazy it's like being sick is really hard for me because i'm somebody who's like constantly working and when you i'm are. sick it's like my body forces me to stop um like i posted one video yesterday Wow. I never post just one video yesterday. Yeah. I normally post like three to five. So to, and I'll probably only post one today too, because I posted one this morning that was like an ad that I had to get approved, so it was like ready to go. <laughs> only posting one video a day is really challenging for me because I like to constantly be putting out content. Um, but my body is like, no, <laughs> you're taking a break. <laughs> it's good. You should look after yourself. And I again, and how are you feeling? Can we continue our discussion? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing good. Like What's interesting is yesterday I had a lot more symptoms. I was like exhausted. I had a fever. Today my fever's gone. The only thing that's still happening Good. is I had a really, 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 really sore throat. So they put me on like antibiotics and all this other stuff. So yeah, I'm doing okay. I think by tomorrow I'll be like ready to go again. Maybe you should take another one video day well, tomorrow. <laughs> well, tomorrow I have, uh, tomorrow and Friday I have a lot going on. So I'm like kind of willing myself to be in a good place tomorrow <laughs> okay i believe in you it's gonna happen then <laughs> I, I yes absolutely so i had uh today has been i went from a media thing to here and then i had two i like i've had six hours of video face to face today oh my god <laughs> but i was looking forward to this there's no way that i was canceling this i was so excited <laughs> ah! uh all right so uh, we are talking about communities. We're talking about being a gamer. And we're talking about your books, okay? Um, and I want to ta- take this conversation in two places. We're going to go back to this other fork about community when we talk about uh, your books and being a content creator. But I would like to uh, go back to the, as somebody who was enjoying like platform games and uh, Jurassic Park, which fandom was the original one that you participated in its community or were you participating in the gay community first no i feel like i barely uh, even now i feel like i barely participate in the gay community um, <laughs> even to this day um i the first fandom i ever like participated in the community i think i know the answer but i don't like it um <laughs> Say Diablo 2. No, No, I think the first community that I really participated in and I was like an active participant in that like, you know, I knew people because of the community. They knew me because of the community. And like when I went to conventions, I would seek those people out. Was probably My Little Pony. (laughs) I love that so much. I mean, there was a time now when I think I think now when we think about the My Little Pony fandom, like it got really dark and really weird uh, at a certain point. But there was a time before that where it was just like you was were really a brony, fun, wholesome, happy show. <laughs> and I will say, I didn't get that. Oh my gosh, my stupid. Um, I will say there's one. Be- I just realized there's one before that, but that was like the first one where I felt like I met people in in my in real life because of the community. Uh, before that, though, in an online space, I think my um, my first community that was like online was uh, probably through Digimon. Um, like Digimon kind of. Okay, to, like, so you were uh, you know, and forums, following stuff like yeah. boards, all of those. When did you start creating content for a community? Honestly, I think the first. Con- I mean, I was writing, but really the first. So before I ever got into writing books, I was writing comics uh, and like web comics and stuff. And so I went to conventions before, like back in the day when I would try to like kind of sell print versions of my comics. So that was like my first kind of the first time I got really into kind of invested in the um, the community of like nerdiness. Um, but I think the first time I was really like creating content for a community was like on TikTok. Like when I first started TikTok and was like doing content around like reading and books and Uh, book reviews and stuff like that that's very interesting like i sort of fell into trying to commoditize my creative work much like much later Mm -hmm. like uh but you were like hey i wrote this thing you should you should buy it like when when was this yeah i wrote comics um and i was pretty young at that point i think i was i started writing comics when i was like 18 or 19. Um, were you also illustrating them no, I had a friend who was doing illustrations at the time. 
Um, but, you know, I think, you know, I've had, I've wanted to create things for a long time. I mean, um, I guess my comics might have been later, like 21, 22, now that I think about it, because I went to school for, like, film writing and direction. So, like, storytelling was always a big part of what I wanted to do. Um, but I also, you know, have really struggled with a lot of social anxiety in my life, being an introvert. So I think making myself, like, the center of that storytelling didn't really happen until I started doing, like, TikTok and things like that. What year is that? Like, how old is your account? Three years. I started okay. in 2020 in, uh, in April of 2020, kind of when a lot of people started because of pandemic. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, it seems like you've been doing this forever, but uh, yeah, like you just doing it forever. <laughs> but you've been doing th three videos a day plus X amount of live for like yeah, so that's yeah, time in. Right. Yeah, uh, absolutely, that is incredible. All right, so I'm I'm interested. This like like tan you feeling tangential to the gay community. Uh, I understand that feeling very well. Like when did you first decide? Oh. Okay, I gotta go interact with this group because these are these people are supposed to be my people. But maybe I'm more of a geek than I am uh, a, a gay man. <laughs> you know what? I I will say. I mean, even now I struggle with it a lot. I struggle mm -hmm. with the feeling part of the gay community. Um, you know, I talk about gay books on the internet. I you know I, I do have gay friends, um, but I. I didn't even go. Hey, to Carl is present in your right, content, yeah. I, right? I, I, I'm married to another man. Like, I didn't <laughs> go to my first gay pride um, until I think I want to say two two years ago. Like, oh, um, nice. Yeah, like I, I don't know. I I've, I think in general I have a hard time. I, like, I don't have a lot of like really good. I have a very small group of friends. Like, I I think I have a really hard time with like spaces where there's just like a ton of people um i think that's why board games i've seen you at gen con jason you are laser beam focus is that yeah, how you survive that environment like, is your schedule like work right like right GenCon works for me because i treat it Happy like, Pride. like work and i think that i've always had a hard time really mixing with like groups of people and so board gaming for me is really nice because a lot of times it's very one-on-one -on -one. like even at a place like gen con when you sit down to play games with people it's like two or three other people, right? And that is much more manageable for me than like, for a long time, the thought of going to like a gay bar or to Pride or to a club or any of that was like terrifying to me. Um, a, a little bit, it still is. Um, I went to WeHo uh, in LA uh, a, a month and a half ago and they took me, yeah. some friends took me to like some of the bars there. And even that was like, they had to keep checking on me. They're like, are you okay? Are you doing okay? Are you okay? Um, and it's because that amount of people and that amount of like unknown uh, is still very stressful to me. So I don't know. I think, uh, I think. I, I think that's interesting. Um, that's how you, you, you see the, the community as a whole and you see that as the, your barrier from the, the, from the community, right? Yeah. Like um, that. Uh, hmm, I'm going to have to unpack that a one for a bit. Of, there was a room full of like gay people and a room full of gamers, like board gamers, whatever, and you told me to pick a room to go into, I'd probably go into the room full of board gamers, right? That I would too, safer. absolutely, 100%, every time. Safer, yeah. um, that's if, and safer, and what I mean by safer is that is the space where I feel like I could jump in, probably talk to a couple strangers, um, feel welcome. I never, growing up, I never felt super welcomed by the gay community, you know, I. Um, I am not the traditionally attractive gay man. I am not. You're very um, attractive, Jason. Uh, I'm not like you. I'm not like you yuck my yum. yum. You can't do that. LA, you can't do that. LA gay. <laughs> um, I, um, you know, I think that I'm like a huge nerd. Like my my perfect Saturday night is like playing a board game or playing a video game or reading, right? Um, and that I think made it really hard for me to come into spaces that were just very much about. Um, much more about like the outgoingness and much more about getting to know like strangers and things like that. That always really scared me. Let's talk about this. Um, from my perspective, I would choose the room of, of gamers because I am horrible at social interactions without structure. 
Yeah, and that's what and board games really provide that, and I I think that's yeah. a big reason why I like why I like the concept of board games as well. Um, when uh, that being said, the only gay outlet that I had when I was in the service where you could be out was sneaking to the only one gay bar that was on wasn't on the eighty six list for uh, for um, the naval base that I was on. Or when I w- went to college, uh, you know, these spaces, like I went to a very liberal place, but still everybody's finding himself. And um, it was hostile. Like it wasn't particularly safe. Like if yeah. you've ever been to a gay bar in Detroit, have you been to a gay bar in the city proper? No, I'll only if they all have really barbed wire. Like California. They, they have six feet fences and barbed wire around the top. And oh my God. <laughs> It's like an encampment, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> it's it's a very serious thing. And so um, I was never good at uh, meeting dudes at a bar. So when uh, the advent of things like gay.com and like the internet and like gay personals, like I could understand that interaction. It is my job to get you to respond back and laugh at my very dumb jokes. It became a game. Like I, I gamified it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I totally agree with you. I think I'm someone that definitely responds well to structure. So I I mean, even with like non gay friends, like when we're, when I'm going to hang out with somebody new for the first time, you know, my ideal way of doing that is something that's an activity. So like, you know, let's, I live really close to Disney, right? Like let's go to Disney. Let's go, let's, you know, come over. We'll play a board game. Like, to me, that's much better than like, oh, let's go get a drink or let's go get a coffee or like that's just you and me sitting down to talk. That sounds like a lot. Let's go somewhere where there's an activity involved. Oh, that sounds intense. It does sound like. But all right. So I have a bridge. I have a bridge activity between you and like the muscle boys. OK, you could say, hey, why don't you help me move these pile of books around my house? It'll be like <laughs> it'll be like legs and, and arms day for you. By the way, I'm very smart and charming. Can you do this? And then you guys can do this shit together. And that's that's the perfect like activity plus useful plus I'll try like that. you should try that. Like we should we should hook you up with this. Look at something out Carl will get something out of it. Like there won't be these fire hazards in your house anymore. Yeah, there's definitely a lot the- of fire hazards in our house. That's like that's what I'm worried about. One of these times, like you are like crammed in doing your your video at your one table, right? And then some a lamp cut, uh, uh, happens, hit in a weird place. If, if your a fire cat, happens in our house, we're, yeah, we're your done. cat we're dashes done. to some place unfortunate, and then fire just erupts. Yeah, everywhere. I actually I blew up an electrical socket the other day and I was like, what? myself. Be- well, because. I was frustrated and I was trying to get it to stay in one place and then I accidentally touched the metal to it and it was like a whole, it was like, Psh! and I, it, it blew out the fuse. It was like a whole thing. So that's what happens behind the scenes on my video. <laughs> <laughs> Chaos. You, you, your house, you should not have sparks flying around your house. No. Your house is not the spark. No. no. It was very no. bad. No. <laughs> But yeah, we should definitely try this out. Like, we should go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, like there are rules for engagement um, in any community, and if you do not fit that mold, be it like online gamers or be it like like gay men at a bar, like um, you get end up getting ostracized a little bit. And this is why we're talking about today's topic about being a gamer with a Y. Like, uh, I have more things in common with gamers uh, most of the time than I do, like, I don't know. And this comes from somebody who ran a gay youth publication for two years. Yeah. I, yeah, I used to have to go to, I had to live at the bar for all the various reasons for charity, articles, talent, whatever it is. That gave me my agenda. I knew why I was going to be there. And if I happened to interact with somebody, great. Uh, yeah. but normally I was laser beam focused on doing the thing. Yeah. Okay. Or I, I think what's interesting is like right now, you know, in my, in my thirties is the first time where I'm really starting where like, I feel like I have like a trusted group of gay friends. Um, and they are all people that I met through creating content, like creating content on TikTok. Like the people that I now, I mean, like one of my best friends that 
I, I often, like, he and I refer to each other as, like, our brothers, like, our brothers Aww. and different mothers, right? We met through TikTok, right? And I think it's it's really special that I've kind of now found that. I found that human interaction through a very non-human point, right? Like, he and I met through TikTok, and since then, we've met in person. Like, I stayed at his house when I went to L.A. Like, Ooh. we've become really, really, really good friends. Um but it all happened through this like social media space, which I think is super cool. I find uh, my surprise person to that level is Dandy's da- uh, Danny's Dandring. Like, yeah, I I text her like, "So you're on your way to work, huh? You had to drive <laughs> in today, eh?" She's like, "Yeah, I fucking hate it." And I'm like, <laughs> "Like, what are you doing today?" She's like, "I'm getting another nose piercing with my daughter." I'm like, "You go." <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> And I did not expect that that would happen, right? Yeah. Uh, but she's friends of my friends, and we just like you know just weird interactions via this seemingly artificial. There's something that resonates where you get close to people. Like yeah. it scared the poop out of me the other day when you called me when you're doing dishes. I'm like, what what is going on here? I hope his house is not <laughs> on fire. <laughs> I was like, hello, like expecting to be punked by something like, like oh my God, let's talk about this stuff. Uh, but content becomes something we're passionate about. Like, uh, one of the things that really helped me about, uh, out about, and I really want to say thank you for is this crafting of content, this understanding about like what we can do to beat the all gay rhythm. Like, as they say, the black comic book geek says, like what we can do to like, um, and then crafting these moments to be better at what we do and be proud of making it happen, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like all of the Danny algorithms also occurred- massively changed again at the beginning of June, and I don't even know. I don't even know anymore. <laughs> I don't know. It's what hard happened. for you. Like you, this is your livelihood. Like this is a this is a yeah. deal, right? It's, I, it's it's really it's really, and I mean, this has happened a lot in the past, but I since the beginning of June, I'm really seeing this a lot with TikTok, which. It's very unfortunate because, you know, TikTok is where I have my my biggest following, right? Like, but what's upsetting is to have, you know, I have three times more followers on TikTok than I do on Instagram. And when I post a video on both platforms, the video on the same video, same exact video, same music, same everything, the version of it on Instagram Reels gets five times the amount of views, which is crazy to me like that should not be the case right like it just shouldn't be it it should be the other way around and it's very frustrating but i do think it's always an opportunity to try new things right to experiment to see what works to refigure it out um it's just a shame that it's like we have to do we have to do that every month when tiktok decides nope we're gonna completely change what's worked for you Here's a new thing. Figure it out. You know. Well, the thing is, they, you know, there's eight, you know, eight plus twelve plus what algorithms stacked on each other. You know, depending on what they're trying, they they prioritize or reprioritize different ones based on different decisions. Yeah. Right. And um, you know, uh, I know I I really felt that shift when you had told me this this work for your content blah 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 and they deprioritize time in on like making content uh by a lot and it's not that it disappeared it just by a lot and yeah. so and then i was like oh <laughs> i went from i went from uh 10,000 to a thousand like it cut me in like t- to a tenth of the the stuff yeah. and i was like oh yeah, I feel I think, that. I mean, they're constantly kind of pushing new things and kind of put, the one thing I found is I do think they prioritize, they still kind of prioritize live streams. Like, um, I know that if I'm having a rough day, like if I post videos and they're doing terribly, I can almost guarantee if I do a live stream, at least somebody's going to see them, which I think is hard because at this point I'm live streaming five to six days a week and like, how long can I maintain that? Who even knows, right? Like, I guess we'll see. Yeah, like, random old Asian guys are bugging me in the middle of the week, and then I gotta do this stuff. It it makes me listen to all these compliments, and then talks about (laughs) fantasy situations where big men lift things in my house. (laughs) (laughs) No, absolutely. Um, I I have actually found, uh, with uh, my TikTok friends and our community, like people show up for my lives to just stop in and chat for the day. And I have yeah. found that to be lovely. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, I think I'm, when you do live streams often, you kind of cultivate a little group of people that even if no one else shows up, they'll show up to say hi. And I think that's, it's really nice. It is. It's super duper duper nice. Yeah. Like you can see like the stream of like hearts that I will send at your little Zelda guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, hey, sure, he needs this for his well, algorithm. Like, I'm just playing thinking. video games live on the internet, especially on TikTok, is, it's a rodeo. Like, people are, most of the people are nice, but some of the people are wild. The other day, I had someone, I had an issue, I almost had to cancel live because somebody typed a question, I'll send it to you after this, but basically, oh, no. I am usually really good at, like, reading things before I say them out loud. But oh. because people try to get you to say stuff, like they get you to say. I, I ran into that once, yeah. Right? And, um, but I was sick, had a fever, wasn't doing great. And so I was not at my most alert. So I read it and I immediately realized what they were doing. And I was like, oh no. And then my live access got banned, like within oh, no. seconds. I appealed it and they gave me my live access back really quickly because I think they looked at it and were like, okay, your people are ridiculous. But. It was yeah. really upsetting, you know, and like no, yeah, no, it, it feels bad. It feels bad. It feels bad. And the other thing is, like, when you play video games on live stream, and also I experienced this with board games, which made me kind of stop live streaming board games on YouTube. Man, people uh, with video games, people really want to tell you how to play. They really want to tell you how bad of a player you are. They won't let you solve a puzzle by yourself for anything. So you just can't look at the chat because they have to solve it for you. And with board games, oh, God forbid you mess up a rule because that is. It is like a sin. Like they are, they are so upset if you mess up because it's not about having fun. I don't know if you know this, but board games are not about having fun. They're about. They are the about having fun, Jason. Exactly. Don't say scary stuff. Stop saying if scary you stuff. Don't follow the rules. The fun is over. <laughs> All right. Wild. So, um, it's interesting uh, how people try to get heard, and we're going to talk about this when we. I have you back for another thing. If you ever agree to come back for another thing, oh. we're going to talk about um why people need to be heard as a topic like these are folks who understand what they're doing when they do it and they have a need to and i always i really am trying to take the time to say randoms or like specific people's because i do not like to say general people when something bad happens you know like drivers are idiots or be, like it puts those individuals in a larger group and then isolates us in a smaller group yeah and that means we're disconnected from more people and what's more what happened did you hear the lightning the no no yeah it was really loud <laughs> oh gosh it's well it is orlando yeah like, it's happening orlando has, it's it is, yeah like it's one of the two ozone pl uh, positive places on the planet oh you didn't know that that might explain a lot where's the <laughs> other one where's the other one that's an ozone positive place ah uh, i forgot it's uh, it's it's like a weird mountain range that gets a lot of lightning and i forgot exactly where it is but there's only uh, two i was gonna say is it somewhere else where people behave ridiculously on a daily basis because <laughs> maybe that's the maybe that's the secret uh, maybe it's that's the lightning florida, but yeah florida people are <laughs> does florida man's actions generate lightning for jason please tell yeah, me i think that's it that's okay. okay like like you hate the cold I do hate the cold. Yeah. Is Florida man worth? Is all that worth like avoiding the cold? Like, well, I don't know. I I know we're discussing, especially with things going on in Florida, like possible options and things like that. I mean, we we really like where we live. Like Orlando is. We really like Orlando, yeah. and we really like our friends here. Um, and so it's very hard to be like, oh, you know, how bad do things have to get before we like hop in a U-Haul and get out of here? But, you know, it's something that we're kind of, like, analyzing by the day and just hoping for the best. I don't know. Trying to hope for the good in humanity, which well, does not exist, but we're trying to hope for it. Uh, you heard me scream so loud last Sunday when uh, Peter Yang says, yeah, I knew Jason. He came up here at Chip Theory. <laughs> like, like, we would love to have you up here. The winter would kill you, but we would love to have you up I mean, here. I like. For for, for three days and that winter already I was like <laughs> like the snow my global was warming. Like up it, it to get... my head and I and they were like oh yeah this all just happened yesterday and I was like excuse me <laughs> 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 
funny yeah, like, because I grew up in Den. I grew up outside of Denver, which is cold and gets lots of snow, right? And then I lived in New York for seven years. Yeah, yeah. And gets lots of snow. But now that I'm down here, I've like acclimated to the heat, and the thought of being anywhere cold is just like like I when I went to um, LA recently, it got into like the high fifties, low sixties, and they thought I was being so dramatic because I had on like a sweater and a coat and like I was freezing, like I was. I was like shivering and they're like, um, this is just spring. You need to relax. <laughs> I'm walking out in like, it's 45 degrees. I'm in shorts and nope. the shorts. Nope. And I'm like, it could not be me. Nope. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we talked about like participation as communities. All right. So, Communities around your books, obviously the latest one that was online, like how big are those and uh, do you create content for those communities other than the actual uh, books that you're writing? Um, not really. I mean, when I wrote Mythos, I didn't really have an online community, so I created a little bit of content for Instagram at the time. Um, the community around the book that I wrote online was not really that big, but I also didn't advertise it that much. It was more something that I wrote for myself that I just happened to put online and if people wanted to check it out, they could. Um, I think in the future, if I continue writing, like if I get back into writing professionally or like writing where people can read it, I think that is something I'd probably have to change a little bit because like I am notorious for not really advertising my work or my books at all. You didn't um, know. I knew this about you. And this is why I did not tell you that this is going to be the main focus of our discussion <laughs> today because I know um, you have anxiety. And so I'm like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I mean, it's. Uh, I, I don't have like a huge community around my books and I, I'm kind of okay with that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I love that people read You've published them, six books, Jason. Yeah. I love when people tell me that they've read them. I love when people, you know, come out of the blue and like, oh, I, I just read this and I loved it. And I've got some really amazing messages, but it's not, um, I enjoy the act of celebrating other authors and their work a lot more than I enjoy the act of celebrating my work. You know what I mean? Um, yes, 100%. I feel, I feel imposter syndrome all of the time, but I feel it the most when I'm talking about books I've written. Like, that's when I feel the most like, I do not belong in this space. I have not earned this space. Um, and so I think it's great that people kind of, I, I kind of love that the people who have read them, uh, especially Mythos, because that's what I'm most proud of, have kind of stumbled on them by way of my content. Like, every once in a while, I'll sneak a video in where I'm like, oh, by the way, I wrote this book. And then, you know, people can kind of find it that way. And I kind of like that, that like the, the thought that only like the really like the real Easy Cat fans like know that I'm an author. I don't know. I think that's kind of fun. <laughs> You know, like you are making them stuff. struggle Terrible for it. Time. I understand. You're like, there's these barriers to love me. I should know because I am me. Like <laughs> you do that. I think. I think the most the things that are the most personal to me are the things that are the hardest for me to share. So to that uh, end, right? Like I love talking about books. Um, but like we talked about it today, my first passion, my first like nerdy thing, and the thing that I still do every single day is video games. But how often do I post about video games, right? Almost never. And I think it's because I take it a lot more personally. Um, you know, I also went to, I went to school for film and I love talking about movies. I love critiquing movies. I love um, watching a movie and just ripping it apart for all the things I loved about it. Um, but I don't do that online because I take it very personally and I don't want to argue. There are, there are, I'm fine arguing with a stranger on the internet about a Barbie movie. I don't want to argue with a stranger on the internet about a movie that I loved, right? No. Um, so I think I keep the things that are the most pre precious to me kind of to myself uh, and share everything else. That makes 100% yeah. sense. That's I'm gonna, stuff I'm like, you know, my like Doctor Who reactions or my Supernatural reactions or Barbie reactions are great because it's not something that I take super personally because I'm, I am getting into it with people like people get to see me like getting into it it's not you've fallen like, way oh down God, the barbie hole with the barbie people ever, right? jason huh? <laughs> you've fallen way down the barbie hole with the barbie people like oh, way that's fine the barbie people scare me a little bit but that's okay <laughs> they show up though they show, they show up. up they show up and for the, like 99 percent of them are really lovely i've had a, i've had a couple people I've had to block because of some weirdness but for the most part it's been really lovely okay so two things um 
I 100% understand the uh, want to keep the personal stuff to yourself and the imposter syndrome. I Conquest Princess, hopefully knock on wood, if it gets published, will be my sixth title. And uh, my name is not on any of the boxes. Oh, my gosh. It's not just just didn't happen yet uh there's a social media goal i i i had a bet with our creative director he's like if we hit this social media goal you have to let me put your name on the box oh i love that yeah and we are not gonna make it (laughs) (laughs) there's no 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 we are not gonna make it i'm like ha like yeah he's like no he's like seven your name needs to be on the book like it took a lot for me to get up in front of the camera for my game company i did not want to do it i don't yeah. feel very comfortable doing it i feel like having to say this game is good makes me feel awful <laughs> but the game is good and it needs me to say it like like yeah. I, I i understand am, that and so um yeah like 100 percent. i understand that uh, that total sentiment so yeah keeping the things that are personal to you off of the internet is the reason being old is awesome <laughs> i have so many mistakes and personal moments that had no interaction with the internet yeah. whatsoever like no just not not gonna do it um uh but there's still a lot of you in your content, even about these things you quote unquote do not care about. You bring your personality, your wit, yeah. your laughter, um, and it spreads a lot of joy. And I don't, oh, like, I don't think you should, like, uh, deny what your numbers say that you bring a lot of people happiness. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I, I really like that that part of it. I like, I like the ability to bring, you know, that that's like my favorite thing about what I do on the internet is being able to, you know, make someone laugh or make someone's day a little bit better. And I always kind of say like, um, you know, people, I, in, I've been accused of, um, being toxically positive. Right. And I often, my, often my rebuttal to that. They haven't had that, a phone call with you. <laughs> <laughs> if they knew, if they only knew. In real life, um, like Kervin is the opposite. You like Kervin's got this, like, death stare into the camera and then you talk to him he's all bubbly and like and you're like hey we are positive about everything you know that we're gonna cut that guy i think that um for me i think the the thought that i can put a smile on someone's face who's having you know they're having an absolutely horrible day they're worried they're stressed they're angry whatever like things are just bad right and you know look in the world so much is happening right now that is so stressful and upsetting uh the thought that they could watch one of my videos and just have like a moment of levity, I think is really awesome. Like that makes me really happy. And so when people are like, Oh, well, you're just too positive. I'm I'm always like, well, yeah, I think there's, I think there's space for that. Right. Like I think maybe that's okay because I think there's so much negative in the world that a little bit of positive might not be the worst thing in the world. (laughs) Um, well, I usually tell people, um, what you bring to your camera is what you want to project out into the world. Yeah. People don't remember that Bob Ross would scream himself hoarse to get into the mental state that he needed to be so chill before his his painting videos. Like, does that make Bob's like persona less himself? No. Yeah. That is the part of him that he shined up. Because that is the, the, the string, that's the note that he wanted to carry out into the world. Yeah, and I agree with that. I mean, I think even on my worst days, on days where I just feel hopeless or sad or angry or whatever, I always know that making content is going to put a little bit of joy into my life as well. Like, it's going to give me a little okay. bit of a moment to, like, remind myself to smile, remind myself to have fun, you know, remind myself to laugh a little bit. Um, and I think that has, especially with going through the pandemic when I started, I think that was super important to me. Like, it was really important for me to have that lo- that moment of the day where I knew that I was going to do something light and happy, um, despite everything else being so upsetting. Um, so, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Uh, being able to feel what you want, uh, feel what you need to feel is very important, right? And I think that's what they're trying to talk about. If you're always positive, you're not feeling other things. But uh, that's they have giving yourself... I'm definitely feeling other feelings. 
<laughs> I love that. Uh, I felt very privileged. I was like, yeah, woohoo, all this stuff. We, we is recently talked because we went to, I, I mentioned, you know, I mentioned a couple times I went to LA and we went to Y'all West, which is like a little book festival. Uh, yeah. And I went with my friend Kevin. And what we were saying, which was so funny, is that online, I am very bubbly and positive and happy, right? And online, he is very sassy and sarcastic and kind of, kind of like bitchy. Like, that's kind of how he is online. And in person, we are the opposite. Like he is very bubbly and happy and lovely, and I am a little bit more like bitter and sarcastic. And I think it's funny that we have kind of these like that is how we choose to express those elements of ourselves, um, which I think is really cool. I, I find it so funny that we have these like personas that kind of switch places depending on what we're doing in the world. Um, but yeah, if anybody ever is concerned that I am happy all the time, please just. Give me a well, no, I think if they pay, they pay attention to your you content, well. some of your humor is biting, and that's obviously part of what's going on. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, one of my uh, one of the earliest uh, online games is a game called Bolo. It means communication in Hindi, and it's about playing tanks. And my uh, they organized a league. Uh, at the University of Michigan, so we played it in groups, right? And my uh, my my partners two on two battles. My partner in this uh, was my best friend at, at the time, and he would talk endless amounts of tech smack while we played, like endless amounts. And then we would get into person, and I have this sort of persona, but when I play, I'm just like. I'm not saying anything. I am just in it, right? And but then when we got got out, he would be completely quiet and say nothing, and then I would be this, and then everybody assumed that I was doing all the trash talking all the time. Oh my <laughs> because god! Because it is a, it's a thing. It's like like this idea i'm bringing um this side of myself to be presented and to be used for something right yeah. whatever it is hopefully it's the betterment of uh, everything else what you know but doesn't necessarily have to be but it is still part of you right yeah for sure yeah um and it's still worthy of love both sides yeah so, sure um all right jason I know I'm going to let you go because you have a, a crazy day. Uh, let's start the wrap up. We got five minutes. Like, what can people expect from you going forward with the year? Like, oh my gosh. Uh, um, yeah. So, I am the next couple of places I'll be in person. So, next weekend, actually, I'm going to be at BookNet Fest, uh, which is a little bookish convention, bookish festival. It's a two day bookish festival here in Orlando, Florida. Um, so I'm going to be at that next uh, next Friday and Saturday. Um, after that, I'll be at Dice Tower East um, in July. And then I will be at Gen Con, which is another board game convention, in August. And then I might be at New York Comic Con if I can make all of that work. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. I got accepted um, for a professional badge, but then I have to make sure that all the other aspects of that. Send work. me your Gen Con schedule. I would like us to have, I don't have a booth this time, so if we do not schedule time together, you just blowing past just won't work. Yeah, but I, I'll have to send it to you when we get closer, because a lot of the companies that want you to, like, stop by and, and do stuff, because they don't, I don't think they get the press list until, like, two or three weeks before. Or at least that's when they look at it. They don't look at the press list until two or three weeks before, and then they all send out these manic emails. They're like, please request a time that we can have a blah, 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 blah. There's a couple of things I think I want to have on your radar. Uh, we'll talk about it all, offline, but that you might want to wiggle things around, and you might, when you're getting options with those people, push them to other places yeah. so that I you can do the, this stuff. The nice thing this year is I think I have a little bit more. Um, last year when I went, I felt like, I don't know, I felt very, and even earlier this year, I felt a lot of um, imposter syndrome when it came to being a board game content creator, right? Like I felt out of place. I didn't really feel like it was my, you know, I, I didn't feel like I had a lot to offer them. But now, this year, going into it, I think I do. I, I, I really put a lot of effort into making more and better board game content. And I think that I feel like I have more of a place at the table this year. Where did you get that bear bell? Um, and is it a real thing? Like, Bezier Games and can I borrow it? it? So Bezier Games <laughs> sent me a box with Scram, 
that bear bell, a compass, and those s'mores jelly beans. So I used all of those to make that video. That game actually that's doesn't amazing. even come out till Gen Con, which I realized after the fact of making a video, but that's fine. It's, it's fine to have it a, a little early. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I, I don't know what you're supposed to use it for. I think you might be supposed to use it to scare the bears away. Um, or you are you supposed to say dinner time? Here I am, come you eat me. Yeah, but you would be trying like realistically, <laughs> you're not trying to attract the bears in the wood wilderness. You're trying to get them to go away. Oh, in the wilderness. I, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll talk yeah, we more about that. that like, I don't understand what this is for. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, for fighting a box, of course, we are in the depths of Conquest Princess. We got 16 more days of that. Um, if you have not like followed us yet, you should be watching Evan, my intern's comics, where he is like, like he, his interaction with the. Uh, he had me interacting with the deer and corn, uh, not the deer corn, the infinicorn. I didn't realize it was me until I posted it. I'm like, oh, he's now not even only starting, like, he gets to go on dates with our time agents, but when the space pets uh, start taking it out on somebody, it's me that, that that's happening. Um, we're also posting today on Instagram um, the next uh, part of the Powered by Terrible Democracy adventure we're doing. So um, the Cosmic Cat has visited the end of time and is now interacting with the eternal spikes that keep the Titans pinned to their edifices. And so you have to choose where it goes next. If anybody just joined the live, they're like, this sounds like crazy people talk. <laughs> it is crazy people talk. <laughs> um, uh, uh, most exciting news for us. Um, another one of those like like traditional hardcore gamer channels uh, took a look at Conquest Princess. So this would be uh, Secret Cabal. Um, and Secret oh, okay. Cabal gave us a, uh, a massive uh, a, like thumbs up for Conquest Princess. So um, that's great. They're like, the theme is wackadoodle, but have you met Seppi? This game is actually amazing. <laughs> we need, I mean, listen, I just recently bought a game by Uwe Rosenberg that's about bat farming, all right? A lot of yes! things are wackadoodle, okay? <laughs> right, it's like, but you, like, there's triggering words about princess and fashion, like, all this stuff has been happening in nerddom forever. Like yeah. Wonder Woman's transformation, Eowyn in drag, Mulan in drag, like Sigourney Weaver don donning an exosuit power armor. Like these are all things in nerddom that we have had and they are major fashion like yeah. moments. It's funny that fashion power is like, is like, they're like, ooh, I don't know. But then you tell them like, oh, how do you want to try to play this game about, about bat farming? They're like, yeah, I'll give that a try. Love bat like, farming. Yeah, no, like somebody had restated the, the theme of Conquest Princess in like the most neutral gamer terms. And the other person was like, yeah, I want to play that game. Well, that's this game. And they're like. Apparently, if your gamer is interested, you just have to, it just has to be really boring. Like, you know what would be a fun, fun game? What if we made a game about bird watching? Ooh, doesn't that sound Ooh, fun? Right? And then somebody was like, I, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> and somebody was commenting, like, your game has a lot of color, Seppi. Uh, like, it, isn't it supposed to be like gray or brown or like, you know, all those like men's product colors in the That's aisle for soaps? Thing. Like, <laughs> it, that is definitely a thing. All right, Jason, I don't want you to die. I, I super appreciate you making time for all this. Oh, uh, well everybody, uh, next week's live continues my pride march through TikTokers who are making gaming content. And we're going to talk about. Uh, queer people in RPGs. If you do not know, some of the most innovative RPGs, especially things without game masters and dice, solos, and all, are queer people writing about their experiences. One of them, Jason? I was going to show you something, but I can't find it. A Thousand Year Old Vampire. No, no, no I just got it. But I was going to say, I just posted today a sponsored video for a gay YA rom a romantic romance book, all right? And I, it was, it's written by James L. Sutter, who is one of the co-creators of Pathfinder and Starfinder. And I was like, what? <laughs> it was such a weird, like, crossover. I was like, what? Jason, I'm telling you, we're, we're going to talk more about this. But, yeah, so we're, uh, Heart of the Deer Unicorn is going to show up, and we're going to talk about 
uh, queer RPGs, uh, that, how that, those two things mix. Like, uh, scene four, he swears the future of, uh, RPGs is, uh, trans furries RPGs. And I'm like, all right, let's, 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 let's break it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, part of the, like, Deernicorn is making and, and, um, carrying and publishing and producing some of the most innovative RPGs in the last 10 years, I would say. I love like Wander Home so much. I love everything. it. Yeah, I, I love it so so much. All right. Don't die. I hope you have a good day tomorrow. I'm going to text you, see, make sure, do old guy, like, old gay dad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm supposed to record two podcasts tomorrow. We'll see how that goes. All right. Good luck. <laughs> All right, stream. Everybody stay safe. Have fun. Happy Pride, everybody. Happy Pride.